Can we go to Paul? We can't hear you. Hello? Yeah, Hi. <laughs> Paul Rauschenbusch from Princeton University. I'm wondering, I was just so struck at the G20 with all of the anger that seemed to be in the streets of the protesters. I'm wondering what role religion has as a prophetic witness in, in criticizing actually the global system as, as, one, as one, not just kind of providing for the poor, mopping up after, after inequality, but really trying to change the way we do business. David. The, the demonstrations in London was interesting. They, they uh, focused on uh, what you might call a blue-green alliance. So the global poverty groups were part of a broader alliance of people who, who were saying, I mean, they put it in a fairly in-your-face way, you know, we want to shift from a kind of development that benefits the rich to a kind of development that benefits working people in Belfast, in London, in Bangladesh, in Africa, and also protects the environment. So, um, you know, my style isn't quite that in your face. Uh, but the basic idea, I think, is right. That out of this crisis, we ought to shape a different kind of nation and a different kind of world, which is more attentive to the poor, more attentive to struggling families, more attentive to the environment. That's right. And uh, I think there are strands of the religious community that uh, are in your face and say that in an abrasive way. At Bread for the World, we try to say it in a way that Republican and Democratic members of Congress can understand and act on within a 12-month period. Does anyone want to <laughs> add to that? Yes. Can you hear me? There. I wanted to thank you for pointing out the beauty of what can be done with faith operating in a secular environment where the state and, and governments are protecting the rights of all people. And I wanted to ask you a question. I'm curious as to whether you'll be aware of a uh, current event or problem in our world that um, as religious leaders, um, I think you should be aware of if you're not already. And if I told you there was a country uh, that was asking people to, uh, th that would not give identity cards to people unless they were of a particular religion. What would that remind you of? If I told you that without that card you could not get a transit visa, what would you think that reminded you of? What if that would, uh, without that card you could not participate in any type of commerce, going to the grocery store, selling, bartering, basic things that are needed for survival? And what if you were also ostracized or thrown out of your temple, church, or synagogue? What would that remind you of in current history? I think we're all thinking perhaps of little gold stars at this point. But I'm not speaking of Judaism. I'm speaking of, um, uh, and what if I told you that a very esteemed global leader was the one instituting this policy that people are required to have these identity cards in order to participate in their countries and, and very livelihoods. Um, that person is the Dalai Lama, and I personally have witnessed um, persecution by um, that he has asked people to partake in. I've seen people who have been threatened that have had to move, and uh, people who have visited this country, and uh, the Dalai Lama is persecuting Buddhists uh, in a sect that he used to be a participant in, and I, sorry, I'm shaking, it's just, um, I wasn't, planning to speak on this topic, but I think the world needs to know. And in fact, it was just down the street. There was a protest this summer against him, a small group of 300 people. We had um, some Tibetans here, and we were outside the Dalai Lama's very large gathering at Radio City Music Hall where he was giving a teaching. And when his followers, Can, uh, sorry. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to ask, yeah. are you aware of this problem? Can I ask Cardinal McCarrick, who's been involved in international religious freedom issues to well, comment well, and would, put well, it in context. I would context. say is all of us here, I think, certainly on the panel, we believe that there's the dignity of the human person and that everybody has certain, li certain rights just because they are, they are children of God. We're all God's, we're all, we're all brothers and sisters in, one, in God's one human family. And everything that you say and everything that any of us say has to be judged by that truth. Hmm. I felt it important in this uh, that people in the world need to know that yeah. this is happening. 
because he's a very popular person and, and the governments are using him as uh, political fodder at times. Thank you. I think you, you put that Thank very you. much before us. Can I, we? I have a question here. Um, I would love to speak. I know that there's a woman over there who's also been waiting and so. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't even see. <laughs> okay, well then we'll yes. turn to you. I didn't see okay. there was a microphone there. Mm -hmm. Um, earlier panelists have made clear that one of the big sources of poverty in the world is corruption. And I was wondering what the faith-based organizations, especially those which are large international churches like the Catholic Church, are doing to keep their in-country partners in the developing world above the local level of corruption. Very quickly said it, obviously this is always going to be one of the great problems of our society because it's a human problem. Corruption destroys so much of the good that many people have done and when many people are trying to do. And so we, we try in Catholic Relief Services to, to have a standard of all the partners that we use so that if, if, we, if we find that, that they are not using what we are just helping them to distribute properly, then we stop doing it. So I think that's the general rule. I would suspect that every agency that is worth its salt has that kind of a rule. We're aware of corruption in the world. We're aware of corruption even in our own country, so that this is not something that we, that we are not familiar with. But we have to, each point, point by point, case by case, we have to strive to make sure that the people with whom you are working are going to be as honest as we hope we would be in taking care of the poor. Otherwise, it's a sin, because we don't, we're not taking care of people who need it most. I think some of the most passionate uh, fighters against corruption come from religious communities, but it is ironic that in the global anti-corruption movement they've been less visible than one would expect. And the Berkeley Center has done a first uh, thought uh, piece on this. There should be copies of it outside. It's an important issue. And There's also a kind of corruption in our own society that, I mean, there's illegal corruption, but there's also the corruption that's represented by the whole um, political, political contributions and paid uh, lobbying establishment. So for example, when the farm, in the year that the Farm Bill was considered, 2007, the organizations that represent basically affluent landholders who get protectionist subsidies that don't do much for rural America and hurt Africa, they spent $80 million in Washington in 2007 defending those uh, protectionist subsidies. So it's perfectly legal, it's all above board, everybody knows it's happening, but it's, uh, it's a distortion of public priorities and the only way to fix that is for people, citizens in this country, to raise hell, to follow what's going on and to push for better policies to counteract uh, the impact of uh, campaign contributions and lobbyists that are hired to, to defend private interests over public interest. 